That gets my goat. That gets my goat. That gets my goat. So a few years ago, I went to Six Flags. You know what Six Flags is? Did they? They don't have any by Sacramento, but you surely would have heard of the one in. I have heard of in, uh, in, Magic in, Mountain. Yes. Oh, Magic Mountain. That's what it's called. See, it's so weird. When you get to be my age, you start to crap yourself. I also heard of Magic Mike. Really? Did you enjoy Magic Mike? came from Magic Mountain, right? It was originally a, one of their live shows. They did have a strip show spectacular. So it was so spectacular, <laughs> I couldn't even say the name. <laughs> but anyway, it was me and, and, and my buddy Matt, and we, were, we went on one of those rides that's like a pendulum. Uh-huh. You know, it just goes up and back. And like your favorite ride from the local uh, amusement yeah. park? Yeah. We were sitting together or standing together, whatever you do on those things. I think you just perch. We were perched on the thing <laughs> and I looked across and you know how it's shaped like a boat uh-huh. kind of thing. And so there are people sitting facing you. Right. Everybody faces inward. And I looked over and directly across from me were these two, uh, probably teenage, maybe 20 something Girls, you know, California girls. I wish they all could be those yeah. pretty girls, you know, young, uh, delicious looking. I would, I would imagine they, they, they were attractive. How's that? No, say more words. One of them, the, the, I, in fact, in my in my mind's eye, the more attractive of the two, looked over at me and made eye contact and smiled. And as the ride, you know, went back and forth. I was like, holy cow, this girl is looking at me and I'm looking at her. And even though we're not physically all that close, I'm feeling some kind of connection here. Holy cow, this is this is amazing. This is some kind of – this is what normal people experience. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean it was just it – was, it's a thrilling ride because there's something in your stomach. I, I don't know. I'm sure a scientist like Abby would be able to explain what that sensation is and why it feels good instead of terrible. Because it can feel terrible, you know, the sensation of falling. I, I think I think I know where this story is going to end. It gets to the part where she's at the top point of the pendulum and she finally vomits and it comes straight down and hits you in the face, right? No. Oh, darn. That would have been a much better story if it had. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> and and so a whole episode about vomiting. What do you think? Somebody complained <laughs> about that one episode where I had just vomited before we recorded and we talked about how <laughs> ill I was. Oh, that was good times. Sorry, go on with your story. I'm uh, sidetracking us. So, so like I was saying, it's a fun ride. It feels good. But this felt awesome. I mean, it was a combination of the ride and like some kind of interpersonal metaphysical connection. I mean, it wasn't a physical connection. It was a parabolic yeah. connection. Oh. I, for some reason, it was like, holy cow, this is awesome. This this makes me feel alive. Alive, alive, you know, in a way that I hadn't felt in a long time and got off the ride. You find out her name was Rio and she dances on the sand. Oh, is that what that alive, alive, alive was? <laughs> yes. That must have been a subconscious thing. <laughs> so we got off the ride and Matt said, dude, did you notice? And I was like, you saw it too. Yeah, I, of course I noticed. That was... That was awesome. And he's like, yeah, that chick was totally checking me out. (laughs) Oh, you got to love that. At least it wasn't some dude standing right behind you and over your shoulder. And you started like, what? Making that like hand. You, me, really? And then she just keeps walking right past you and goes to the guy standing behind you. You've probably never had that happen to you. No. It's always you. I'm the guy that's over the shoulder usually. (laughs) That's right. <laughs> this is Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklovich. Welcome, everybody. And boy, have we got a... Well, it's actually a pretty crappy show, but... We should have, like, special music or something for it. I mean, we usually don't do that on That Gets My Goat, but it'd be neat to have, like, a fanfare. I know. we ba ba da ba da Oh, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that didn't work out. The, need to moisten the, the lips ma- a little. The, <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> the mouthpiece. You have to... Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Oh, i got to empty the spit valve. Well, you haven't used it, so I wouldn't imagine my trombone. anything <clears throat> in the spit valve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like too much of an idiot. No, no. That's my job. Ah. No, that's my job. What would be a good uh, song to play for the fanfare on the make, trombone, though? Make it up, man. Like I said, it'll be our new... But that gets my goat theme. <laughs> I don't know if I want it to come back again and again. Though. No, but I'm going to have, I will ask the musically talented out there to do what they will with it. And every week we'll have a different version. 
I know that only two people listen to that gets my go, but still. And only 1% of those two people are actually musically talented. Mm. Boy, that's terrible. I can't get it right. We may have to skip the fanfare. That actually sounded like what they would play uh, after my punchline, really. Yeah? Yeah, it was. That's the one. (laughs) But, wow. A hundred and two. A hundred and two episodes. We made it. We've yeah. actually made it to this milestone. How many podcasts do you... Well, okay. Well, all podcasts that aren't done by us. But <laughs> how many like shows make it to a hundred and two episodes? Seriously, yeah. Isn't that when you can start being syndicated? Anniversary. That's right. Yeah. hundred and two. hundred and two is the one. A hundred and two is the one. Yeah. yeah um, it's the milestone episode. And every time like a nation turns a hundred and two, they... Yeah, big. get laughed at by France and England and those countries that have been around a long time. <laughs> Damascus goes one hundred and two. What do they call that? A centennial by, I think. <laughs> centennial by curious. <laughs> so hey, this is that gets my goats. Final ep- I mean one hundred and second episode. That's right. And here we are, face to face. Go on. That's that's your line. Come on, I can't steal your line. You stole my woman. You can go ahead and steal my line. Okay. So yeah, welcome everybody to That Gets My Goats, 71st episode. Wait, bicentennial, centennial by episode. I think we've already introduced ourselves. Yes. So, so um, I guess that's all we've got for you today, folks. I know. It's just... <laughs> Thanks for listening. Have a nice drive, folks. <laughs> Tip your waitresses. That's right. Sorry we didn't have a more planned. We should have had a more special episode for this I mean, uh, special anniversary. Maybe we could have talked about the new Media Expo trip or something. And I guess we could. I mean, we were going to save that for our next big anniversary episode, but we could do that in this one. All right. We'll do something else for the 106th. <laughs> That's right. Just last week, we went to the New Media Expo in Las Vegas, Nevada, in lovely Las Vegas, Nevada. Beautiful Las Vegas. And it was lovely. It was the 60-something degrees, 65 or something like that at its warmest, right? It was so nice. Wow. We walked outside at night for like 45 minutes. I did it in a short sleeve shirt and was only mildly, very, very mildly aroused. Chilly. Oh, okay. Chilly. I'm sorry. Well, hey, R080T, yes. would you mind editing that out? There's no 80 t He's not allowed here. <laughs> he says he will. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys snapping the cards at me all the time. That got me mildly aroused. I just love that snapping sound. I hated that. I I wanted to hurt them. Yeah, the wow. the thing that amazed me was just how friggin' many of them there were. Can that possibly be a lucrative enough thing that they needed that many people doing that? I don't know. It would be interesting to to talk to one and find out what they're getting paid and I wonder if they're getting paid by the the referral. Person. Yeah, like how many people actually take their card to the strip club and use it to get in with or whatever. There were so many of them and at one point we got lost. And I was at least tempted to ask one of them directions, but uh, I think I was told that if you directly address one of them, they have permission to kill you. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, that was interesting. The one time where we came along and there was like a line. where There was a gauntlet. Yeah. They were just lining the sidewalk. There was probably like 20 of them all in a row. Just snapping their cards and trying to get you to grab them. Of course, Brian Lincoln enjoyed taking them and then giving them to me afterwards. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I don't know if you've looked at one of those cards that they have. Uh-huh. They're pretty uh, intensely pornographic. They don't just stick with just the normal pose. Oh, that's they don't nice. have the little stars to they cover the, the naughty bits. Oh, I assumed that they did. Usually when somebody is trying to shill something, when somebody's trying to get your attention and give you something, they make a lot of noise. They shout. They're like, hey, over here, kid. Oh, you X3, look like... Three X3. Yeah, read step all about on up it. Here. Oh, hey, you look like a gambling fool. Boy. Fool, fool. There you go. <laughs> uh, but these guys were silent except for their dang fingers. Yep. Where they just kept going like this. It's an audio podcast. Oh, dang it. That joke fell flat, didn't it? <sighs> Is it the language barrier? Oh, well, because probably, yeah, if you we... go to any country, any other country where tourism is a big deal, 
the natives, the people that are from there, will have also learned known as natives. Well, I mean, I think of people with <laughs> loincloths and spears when I hear the word native. But okay. the people that live there will have learned enough English or phonetic English to, you know, like you go down to Tijuana, they all speak enough English to get you to come in to enjoy the, the, the cantina or the, the camel Strip show club. or whatever it might be. And just it was so strange to see a bunch of these, well, I'll just say it, people. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to call them Dude. people. I will. Saying nothing, but doing this obnoxious flipping of the cards in your face. <laughs> See, maybe they just did it to me because I was, you know, their size. But <laughs> it, uh, it bothered me. I never got me. one in my face, I'll have to admit. They're like, ah, oh, look at this one. He needs some porn. <laughs> And I don't know why they talk like that in their minds when they didn't say anything out loud. <laughs> okay, so back to the back to the beat, hand. y'all. Yeah, uh, back to the back to the beat, y'all. Y'all. Um, we went to the New Media Expo this past week, which by the time this comes out will be like four weeks ago. Um, it was a a good time was had by all except for Abby. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you get to puke up three days worth of food in one night. Luckily, we were podcasting at the time. We saved it in a big Folgers coffee cup. <laughs> no, coffee it was can. A can. Yeah, it was can. a full can. It actually filled more. I meant we saved the sound effects for future podcasts. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny because she sent an email afterwards saying that she barely remembered that night. And she was just like, hopefully I didn't screw anything up. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, uh, there was some times where you just talked. Despite the fact that there was no microphone in front of you, I don't know if you realized what you were doing. I wonder how the sound picked up on those. We'll eventually get to that because we were recording an episode for the show. I mean, how in, I guess this is in-depth because it's our anniversary show or whatever, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's the extravaganza. Tell, tell the people why we were in Las Vegas, why we were at the New Media Expo. If, 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 there, if you can make it an interesting story for a change, <laughs> I doubt it. I would appreciate it. But I'll do my best. Well, uh, apparently one of the guy who sets up the podcast speakers at the New Media Expo, I guess we should... Let's call him Jim. Okay, we'll call him Jim. First of all, before we get there, let's just say real quick, New Media Expo, what does that mean? It's a convention for people who create what they say is new media, which is blogs, podcasts, video, YouTube video kind of things. That's what this is all about. So it's a convention for creators of this kind of stuff. Not the traditional television, film, radio, right? Newspaper, old uh, media. Those are in the, smoke the, signals. Like those that. are at the old media expo, but in Cleveland, Ohio. That's right, and not to be confused with the old medium expo, where the right. elderly psychics gather. Yeah, the old media. At least they get to meet in New Orleans each year. A little more fun than Cleveland, but you know. Uh, so, anyways, uh, Jim. He uh, contacted Abby Hilton because they were trying to expand their reach, I think, at the New Media Expo. and then get... He wanted a date. Let's not mince words. All right. They were, they were trying to line up some speakers for audio fiction because uh, they wanted to get some more people that were interested in that. So they figured, hey, we get some people that do that, put them in the speakers, and then maybe we can start drawing some people from that crowd as, as well. So did Jim lose his job after this? <laughs> <laughs> so Abby's like, okay, I got to line up a panel. Who should I get on the panel? And she figured, okay, we can get Big and Rich from the Dune Steve. She had invited a ton of people for her panel and then later found out she was only supposed to have, I think, three people per panel. Was that what it was? Or was it four counting the moderator? I think four was the top because you got a moderator that stood at the podium and then you had three people at the table. And she's like, oh, crap, what do I do now? I invited like eight people. And they all said yes. They all already bought tickets. Except for Brian. <laughs> they said, oh, well, that's great. We'll make a second panel. And so they branched it off and had a second panel. So our panel was to be me and Rish, Abby, Lauren Scribe Harris, and John, John Miro, Miro, who rhymes with hero. And then uh, they split off the other panel, which was also invited. We had Marshall Latham. Renee Chambliss and Brian Lincoln were in that panel. And so we had those two panels. At the last minute, John Miro had to cancel because he hurt his back and was unable to sit on a plane flight for many hours. So it wound up being just the seven of us that were there. And yeah, that's how we wound up there. I think that was what I was supposed to tell. Right. And so 
here's the funny thing is I don't know that I ever thanked Abby for all of that. It's too bad. You know, I thanked Jim, who I didn't know, (laughs) for getting us there. It's too bad you don't have a, a way to do that. Oh, you know what? It's a new year, and my New Year's resolution was never to write again. But after that, it was to start text messaging. And so far, I have sent... 807 texts in 2013. Holy... Oh, I'm sorry. Seven texts in 2013. Sounds more like it. But I'm going to send Abby a thank you right now. Through the magic of technology, she will have gotten this text before this episode even airs. I mean, isn't that amazing? Weeks upon weeks before this episode airs. Oh, okay. Through the magic of our slow timeline... It's time travel is what's going on here. While Rish texts, I'm going to do a little tap dance routine just to keep you entertained. I'll play the trombone. Oh, my spit valve is all plugged in. You you play the trombone. Sorry. Okay, then you dance. Hey! Okay, so we're back. And, uh, yeah, and we'd also like to thank Josh Roseman for being here to play the uh, trombone for... Oh, my gosh, Josh Roseman, the the famous writer. No, 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 this is the trombonist. That's the other one. Oh, okay, thank God. Thanks for being here, Josh. Uh, No no problem. (laughs) That was terrible. It just sent on its own. Oh, That's what happens if you wait more than, like, a minute? I've never had that happen to me. Yeah, sure you haven't. It's never happened before. Seriously, baby. (laughs) I can't do two things at once. I <laughs> Do I need to play more trombone music? No. Um, Damnation. Anyways, we got to Vegas on Sunday afternoon. And uh, shortly after arriving, we met up with Abby and Brian and Renee and everybody. And it was really interesting because it was the first time that we were ever able to actually see these people in person. To see the voice come out of the mouth that it comes out of. I mean, we've seen pictures of these people, so we know what they look like. But it doesn't work necessarily. Just seeing a picture of someone and then trying to animate that (laughs) picture in your head or whatever of them uh, speaking when you hear their voice over a recording. It just seems, I don't know, it's weird to see the people in real life. But we got along well, and we had a good time. I'm trying to remember what we did on Sunday night. Did we do anything? Sunday, we had gotten there fairly late, and they were all jet-lagged. Oh, and that's so right. And so what we did was we just sat for an hour or so and talked, finding out what everybody was doing. And then we walked over to the Strip to eat at Denny's. Ah, oh, that's right. We went and, and, and at the, Denny's we were at the night. Rio. Did you mention that? The Rio Pavilion was where the convention was at and Abby and Renee had rooms in the Rio Hotel. Uh-huh. Uh, Lauren and Brian were both staying with Abby. Uh, Marshall had not yet arrived, but you and I were staying with my aunt uh-huh. there in Vegas. It might have been a different experience if we had all like, you know, clustered together as in in a couple of rooms. I wonder if Renee felt lonely that she had her own room or maybe she felt like a a princess or something. (laughs) I did hear her say uh, later on in the week that uh, Abby and Lauren were brave to be sharing a room. With Brian? With someone as devilishly handsome. No, just with Brian. Just with someone that they don't necessarily know really well. They don't, or maybe they do know each other really well. Just, I think she was just saying that she is not someone that can share a room with someone else. I mean, I I assume she shares a room with her husband, but beyond that, she's just like, no, that's more than I can handle. And she was glad, I think, to be in another room. Whereas, you know, they were fine the way they were. So I guess it worked for everybody's style. Uh, the Rio is a quarter mile, half mile from Las Vegas Boulevard, which is known as the Strip. You know, that's where they first built those casinos way back in the Bugsy Malone days. And it was cool, but it wasn't cold. It, it was right. much nicer the next day. But, uh, yeah, we walked over there and ate together and got to know everybody a little bit. I knew Scribe. I knew Lauren. What's this story? Does she not like to be called Lauren? I think she's fine with either. I knew L. Scribe Harris the least of all that group. And just Mm -hmm. because I guess we'd worked with her the least or... She's been on the show plenty. 
not necessarily always asked to be on the show by us. I know that Brian's had her on for lines many times. But the difference between Scribe and the other three is we've actually met Abby and we've done interviews or, you know, sit down conference things with Renee and with Brian. Right. And so, I mean, I feel like I've actually talked to them. It's, it's right. essentially telephone conversations. Mm-hmm. And with Scribe, I hadn't. Mm-hmm. But, and I think you felt the same way. In fact, you already said so while I was texting. Everybody got along so well and there was no uh, clickishness of, you know, we're going to go off together and you guys aren't really right. part of it. And I mean, just everybody was so friendly, uh, like yeah. we were all friends from high school or something, comfortable with one another. At least I felt that way. And I'm not usually. I'm usually the, oh, I, I want to be by myself and nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I, I You know, I'm going to go feel sorry for myself. And I didn't feel that way. Yeah. Scribe. Scribe has a really outgoing personality. So she, despite the fact that we didn't know her before we got there, it didn't take long before we did. Or at least that we felt we did. I don't know. Maybe we still don't know. She's got layers upon layers, like an onion. And uh, getting to the core is people, just... A- people don't like onions. Like a, Maybe like a, a, a seven-layer cake. Like a rose. Like a... Seven-layer dip? Like a five-layer burrito. Okay. Really. In fact, like, that's like- how I would describe Lauren. <laughs> if somebody said, well, what did she look like? I'd say... Like one of those... Uh, Tacos that you get at, at Taco Bell where they have the soft taco and then the crunchy taco. On the outside. Yeah. There you go. Just like that. Imagine that with <laughs> glasses there that she only occasionally wears. Right. All right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good looking group. I know I mentioned that in my blog, but I wasn't joking around. Usually you'd think that people that only work in audio are unattractive. You'll see the people who do the voices for cartoons or whatever, and you'll be like, ugh. (laughs) And that's why I would always get angry when you hear, like, Christina Hendricks was cast as Lois Lane in this Superman cartoon. And I was like, oh, please. There's like 14 ugly girls that could have done a better job than Christina Hendricks. (laughs) 14. Sorry. A million and four. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, I just, I was impressed by that, too. I was impressed that we all got along, that everybody was so creative and personable yeah it's interesting because there i went there with like an agenda and that agenda was i wanted to get a lot of crap recorded from people because i had them all there and i could just say hey sit down read this read this do this you know record go with two hours of prep time for the friggin microphones you mean right (laughs) but that was my agenda and we got along so well that I wasn't nearly able to accomplish all the uh, recording and slave laboring that I had planned because, yeah, we just sat around talking and chatting and enjoying ourselves enough that I was just like, oh, man, we just chatted for an hour and we could have totally been slaving away. That would have been so much less fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, eventually we'll talk about the actual recording. Uh huh. And, dude, that was so fun. It was. There was this time that I was on a ride at Six Flags. Yeah. And Some time at band camp? It was well, I guess we can talk about that, but we all band camp? You and I, yes. <laughs> Allison Hannigan and I, uh, I. I did something with my trombone. You want to hear about it? You and James Vanderbeek. <laughs> Wait, how does that <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Roseman. Like you said about your agenda, you packed up not only the microphones we're using now, but the microphones we used to use. And the microphones we used to use before the ones that we used to use. Seriously? I had six microphones. I knew that there was really unlikely any way that we could string those all together into one recording, or even two recordings for that matter. We probably could have done it in three. Although, if you remember how much trouble we used to have with the cords on the really old mics that we used to use before the mics that we used to use. The ones that would short? Often? Yes, that would short all the time. I think they're still shorty. Yeah. I, I don't know if those ever worked, those cords. They probably never would have. Maybe I should have tried. You know, it's funny. You didn't I, even try. I didn't. That's the problem. I kept saying that several times. Oh, yeah, next time we get together, we need to get all the crap out and see if we can hook it all together in a way that will work. And then I never did. And so then I just brought it with me. If I tried beforehand, maybe I could have said, oh, you know, I could really use this adapter. And then I could have bought it before we went. But you didn't even try. You didn't. Because you had talked about this agenda of, hey, we could record at least, you know, some kind of short story or whatever. I wrote a sketch for it and uh, I brought a story. I thought of one that I thought would work for the group that we had. 
I know Marshall prepared something. Lauren prepared something. You had one of your stories, <laughs> right? I, am I forgetting yes, anything? Yes, I did. Have one of my, and then I printed them all out and then failed to bring them with us. We were going to help Clay Duggar on his production. Yeah, we had that. And it just, the time ran out. Yeah. Even skipping panels, which I'm sadly going to admit that we did with gusto, <laughs> this, this, there was just not enough time. And when I look back and I think that fully half or more of the time that we spent recording was for me, things that I had written, I feel so lucky. Like, you know, they spun the wheel and it landed on me twice or something like that. And yeah. it just, this was an experience that I hadn't had before. I, I've talked, even on our On The Go episode, I talked about the writers group I used to go to in Los Angeles. And there were a bunch of these people who wanted to be writers or screenwriters or poets. And also most of them had at least some kind of acting background or maybe, maybe not, but it, it just seems like being a writer lends itself a little bit to that. And we would have some really talented people that would read and or slash perform, especially when it was a screenplay kind of situation. And it, oh, it just, I always got a thrill when there were talented people that were passionate, that were putting themselves into it. And, and yeah, we've talked about what a good narrator or a good reader is and what a bad one is. And everybody in this room was passionate enough to have come hundreds, if not thousands of miles to talk about podcasting. And so they're all professional level voice artists. And to hear all this talent in one room doing my story, whether the story was mediocre or whether the story was great, it sounded great. Right. So that felt so good. It felt like I was a winner in the game of life. That's the first time too, right? That's how you <laughs> felt growing up every like Friday and Saturday night. And I just, I, I didn't get a lot of that. So that was really, really cool. And we recorded that for a future episode of the show. You filmed a couple of moments from it. And I believe you put that on YouTube or? Well, yeah, I just hosted them. I put them on my blog. Oh, okay. Would you put a link to that in this? I will. Post? You know, I, I think I may actually repost that blog on the Dune Steve blog, which is where these posts also appear. But I will also put a link and, uh, or I'll try to remember to put a link anyways. The cool thing about it, I think, was that everybody there had either gotten their start with the Dune Steve or done several episodes with us. You know, we, they were all kind of vitally linked to our podcast in some way or another. And I think at the very least, they were sort of fans of our show. So... We were able to monopolize their time like that. We could say, hey, you could be on our show. And they all say, oh, I would love to. Well, I appreciate them doing that. Yeah, me too. I mean, like Abby, it was her room. And <laughs> right. she could have said, you know, I dictate what we're going to do and all that. And there, again, there were no prima donnas. There was nobody who felt like they were better. Well, okay, except for you. Than the other people in the room. And I, I, to me, that's saying. just so rare, especially at this event, which is another thing I guess we should talk about. The New Media Expo, it's not really designed for what we do. It's all about the dynamics of increasing your market share, of monetizing your site or your vidcast or your podcast or your blog or whatever, so that it gets more hits and you get more money coming in. And also, Here's the technical ways of making this faster or better or higher quality or so that more people can view it on more platforms and things. It's very technical and money oriented. Right. And almost our entire group was much more about the content and the passion and having a good time, which often the art part of things clashes with the commerce part of things. Yeah, that's one of the th things they were trying to change about their uh, convention in general. And that's one of the reasons why they had us out is because, yeah, they know that they have that kind of a reputation. They want to change it and be able to expand and, and include the art part as well as the commerce part. But a perfect example of what the New Media Expo is about, the very first day we got there, we got in an elevator. We got in the elevator <laughs> with a stranger, with a guy we'd never seen before. Uh, but we'll be waiting for us in hell. <laughs> and he uh, he saw that we had passes around our necks. And what did he say to you? You're here for the new media expo. Did you want to do an elevator pitch 
or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But. Yeah, I remember it, him saying, you got 30 seconds or, or quick, <laughs> give me your elevator pitch. I kicked him three times. How many times did you kick him? <laughs> I don't know if you could call what I did kicking. It was more stomping. Okay. After he'd gone down from your kicks, then I kind of just finished him off. You know, I've complained about this a lot. I complained about it in my blog. I complained about it with everybody I talked to. I complained about it with you on the drive home. But it wasn't until today that it occurred to me that maybe I should have gone to some of those panels <laughs> because... This is not something that I am interested in. This is not something I am good at. This is not something that I lean towards. You know, our panels, as great as they were, told me mostly things that I already knew. But how to be the first to get a million unique hits for your personal niche audience, or that sort of thing, which I made fun of, that was an actual panel, that might have been useful. If I had gone to those panels with an open heart, sorry, open butt, <laughs> open legs, with an open mind, maybe I could have brought something that we could use. I, I feel disingenuous saying that because I know myself. I know yeah, that I people that... would have been like, would you stop rolling your eyes? I can hear it three <laughs> rows ahead. I think that that's the problem. It's something that we need. But it, I mean, you got to know your limits, know your strengths and weaknesses. Know his limitations. And it's not the strength of either of us, unfortunately. We're not the kind of people that can do the business end of an operation like this. We could create the content if we had a third person that was the guy that was in charge of advertising. Yeah, in charge it was of hustling the advertisers promotion. and doing the elevator pitches and attending that terrible last keynote thing that we went to and getting all the wonderful info that they had to share in that one there are bendy phones coming yeah and sock smart socks oh, geez. <laughs> well i can see the reason you would want a smart sock is so you could finally discover what becomes of right. that errant sock yeah when Which you put like, it into oh, the dryer lithuania <laughs> how did the sock get there right that would be nice Okay, so finish what you were saying uh, about if we had something. Yeah, if we had a third person, you know, a person that has that kind of a bent. I heard, I think it was the Nerdist guy who, when he was talking, he said he had a partner. And the partner was perfect for him because he's like 80% business and 20% art. And then Nerdist guy is 20% business, 80% art. So they work together. Chris Hardwick. Right. I can't remember his name, so I just call him Nerdist because it's easier. Hardwick by name. Very hard wick by reputation. Yes. So anyways, yeah, you, you you put those two together and they were able to create a media empire that was bought up by so a soulless co corporation. And Viacom. he's a bazillionaire. If Not bad could, for a Bradley Cooper lookalike, huh? Yeah, if we could find uh, that third person to come in. I think that third person is living in L.A. right now. And doing something much better with his life, unfortunately. Yeah, there are, there are people out there that know how to do these things. That, that Maybe that was their major in college. Maybe that was always their passion. Or, or just they have some aspect of their personality that makes it easy for them. Or they have worked on it. You know, developed this part that so it has become easier. And that person we could really use to become something bigger than we are. Uh, at this rate, it's not going to grow much more. But Brian Lincoln seems to be one of those guys who works at it. Yeah. He, when the rest of us went out to get pizza, he went to one of these gatherings of, of people there for the New Media Expo who were really there for the New Media Expo and, and hobnobbed and, and, and got to know some of these people, you know. And that Yeah, he met some podcasters that he wanted to meet, that some guys that do the podcast that's like the most downloaded podcast in the entire universe which sadly is a fantasy football podcast i mean i love football but i don't i just fantasy football just can't get into it what, why. why not i don't know what, what is, is your fantasy big anchorage <laughs> You know that show that you hate really, really bad? That Big Mad Bang Theory. Mad TV. Oh, Mad show? TV, yeah. They had one of those little skits where it was a fantasy football, but they had like wizards and like dragons and crap doing the football. It was actually fantastic. Did Frank humorous. Caliendo do his John Madden? Because that's all Frank Caliendo can do. I don't know. I don't think Frank Caliendo did anything. Now, here's a guy who, uh, when you pass the ball to him, 
Here, he runs with it and he tries to make a touchdown. And here, here's a guy I can't do. Yeah. Madden, I, I can't remember can, their jokes. but And that's it. They were fairly humorous. And they did have Gandalf go out there and go, you shall not pass. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah, it probably wasn't. <laughs> but Brian was able to get up early and stay out late to, I'm assuming, get his name out there, get to make contacts with people in that world, in the podcasting world, which I'm sure we would have benefited from. Yeah, probably. But we kind of went there with a different agenda, as I could say. But our agenda, not the agenda that I was saying that I had before, but our agenda was to go and have a good time with the people that we normally don't get to see in real life. So we were happy to skip things here and there so that we can go and do whatever it is we felt like doing at the time. So I don't know. I think we both won. Yeah, it was a resounding success in that area. We also, the next day, the second day, got to hook up with Marshall Latham, uh, who I don't know that we've mentioned. He flew in the next day. Right, he got there Monday. uh, His work wanted him to fly to Canada, to Toronto, and and do some work-related stuff. And he said, okay, I'll do it, you know, as soon as I'm done with this podcast thing. So actually, Tuesday night, he flew to Toronto. Right. uh, Which... I don't know if you'd heard this. It's another country. What? Yeah, the country of Toronto. Oh, no. That's a state. I saw the movie about it, The 51st State. With Drew Barrymore. And yeah, had Adam Drew Sandler. Barrymore and Alice Sandler in it. <laughs> I thought that was pretty dedicated yeah. that he would do that. And I didn't have all that much going on. So it wasn't a giant sacrifice for me. But for you, you had to take time off. You had to sell one of your children. And you had to have your wife take time off to mourn for the loss of that child. Dude, that was a big sacrifice, I thought. (laughs) Yeah, I suppose. It's really not that much of a sacrifice to take time off of work. Everybody kind of enjoys that. Okay, but it's three days (laughs) that you will not have now going someplace with your family, going to some god-awful family reunion (laughs) in Banff or someplace in Canada. Oh, yeah, we might. So I'm just, that's a sacrifice, I think. And, and the hell I'm sure you got when you got back for <laughs> never calling her once <laughs> because you didn't. Yeah, I'm sorry, because you forgot <laughs> to take a charger for your phone. <laughs> Sadly, you forgot to take a charger for the uh, the I tablet, for, yeah, too. Otherwise, to we would charger for anything or we'd already be done with this 102nd episode. That's for sure. And it would have been much louder and... We're probably longer. Possibly. It was Canada, it's an eight-hour drive. Well, yeah, we were stuck in the car all that time. Although my arm would get tired after a while of passing that thing back and forth and back and forth. So I could only go for a certain amount of time. Whereas here, the microphone stand does that for me. Oh, I was going to mention that one of your arms is much more muscular than the <laughs> other. One of my arms is much more muscular than the other. It gets so much more exercise. Yeah, it looks like your wrist is especially strong. Yeah, I barbells. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so... Ostensibly, we were actually there to do a panel, a panel that was on Tuesday. It was the last panel of the convention. Is it okay to call it? What I, think, it I think it's called. Is convention. expo short for exposition? Yes. Which means displaying something? I think so, yeah. I don't get that. Like, oh, we're going to the gun expo where a lot of guns will be displayed and demonstrated. Yeah, I think it just kind of goes as a synonym for convention and conference and okay. fair. There were a lot of catchphrases and abbreviations and words that I had not heard used in that specific way. The same way that, you know, if you hear somebody talk about medical things, you hear somebody talk about the law, you hear somebody talk about Star Trek, you know, something that you're not part of. They use terminology that where you're just like, wow, you know, kind of thing. And I think you probably got that when you and I first became friends and I would talk about retcons and things like that, right? Because you're right. not a comic book guy and latent mutant powers and breasts, you know, things that you don't encounter in real life, uh, that I don't encounter in real life. Monday was the first day of the conference, the convention. No, no, Sunday was because they had panels that we missed and the dating shit uh, stuff. <laughs> okay, I suppose Sunday was the first day there was panels. Monday was the first day that we were there in time for anything. Friends, we did go to a, a panel, panel about podcasting using an iPad. Did we go to, out to pizza that night? That was the night we did, right? We came yes. back from the convention a little early 
and you and I went out to your car and we pulled all those microphones that I brought out of the trunk, took them upstairs and spent a long time trying to figure out how we could hook up all six mics. We, I think, had five set up and we were pretty sure we were getting sound from them, although I think we were wrong. Luckily, one of the mics we didn't even try to use. He didn't even try. It was just sitting over there by itself while other people read. But Rish had a story. That was the other thing that we ran into problems with all the time. Rish sent me this story a couple days before we left for the convention, and I printed out like five copies of this thing. And I printed out two copies of my own story as well, and then I left them at home. And so the whole time, we kept trying to figure out, like, okay, we've got this story here. It's been emailed, and we would try and get on the Wi-Fi that you could get at the convention to get it downloaded off of the email onto whatever laptop or whatever that we had. And we would put it onto a USB stick and transfer it over to the other laptop. And, and you know, we were doing all this crap to try and get it so that everybody had a... And you had to walk half a mile just to get the Wi-Fi signal. You couldn't get the Wi-Fi signal in the room we were recording. Right, yeah. You had to get a different Wi-Fi signal at the hotel itself. The Wi-Fi signal we could get was in the convention center, which is, yeah, a little ways away. And if you've seen hotels in Vegas, they're large. So, yeah, it was the other end of the hotel. So, yeah, we finally got it set up so that there was microphones and something to read off for pretty much everybody. We still would share a fair amount like when I delivered my lines, I had to kind of lean over the side of the couch and I was basically nuzzling up next to Brian Lincoln's ear just to get close enough to his mic that I could say my lines into it. But I thought it was really fun. Because uh, he smelled so good? Oh, yeah, you wouldn't believe. It was really fun to just get the, everybody going at once. Like the energy in the room was really... There was just like a real, like a, a feeling, you know what I mean? It's just like a performance or something. I don't know how to describe it really, unfortunately. It's electric. Boogie, woogie, woogie. <laughs> wow, you took the words right out of my mouth. So what I'm here for. Where was your involved sensibility then? It was kind of electric. It was interesting because, you know, we have funny parts of the story and people were laughing out loud. Hopefully none of that is on the recording and we can't get it out. But if it is, oh well. We're not uh, redoing them. And yeah, other parts where it got scary, you could see people tense up. And gosh, some of the lines, like Renee delivering lines of being scared. Oh, it was amazing. It was so good. The acting was going on and just everything about it was just really fun. And because of that, I, th I don't know if Marshall had planned originally to have us all read his story or we did that reading. And then he's like, well, that was awesome. Let's see what I got we can do tomorrow. And was it that same night that we did the other reading? Yeah, most of us went out for pizza. Yeah, we went out for pizza. Brian Lincoln went to the uh, podcast awards, I think it was. And then when we came back, we got everything back out and we recorded another story, which is one that Scribe had standing by. And she got it all polished up so that we could read it and we did it again. This is for her Pendragon Variety podcast or is this a different podcast that... I think her plan was to use it on the Pendragon show. Okay. Eventually, she's going to become an audio fiction magazine. True. Yeah, she was planning on doing that. And this is one of the stories that's going to be run there. And, and we'll, we'll mention it when it happens. And yeah. It's basically me. It was like the big Anklevich show, really, when we did that one. Because there were four characters, I think. There was me. I was the narrator. Rish was one character. Brian Lincoln was another character. And there was like a little boy that had like two lines that Abby said. Why would you give Abby the little boy voice? I guess Renee sounds too much like a little girl. You do. So for the most part, it was narration, unfortunately. It was just me reading, 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 reading. Rish says a line, reading, 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 Brian says a line, reading, reading, you know, it was, it was kind of like that. I almost felt like I was sitting there and everybody was kind of arranged in front of me. I felt like I was oh, like an author a doing a or Yeah, or like I was the guy at the library. Okay, children, gather around. I'm going to read to you. Everybody poops. Yes. My favorite story. It was fun. Just the way that whole, you know, people would, for both of the readings, we'd be going and then somebody would like, take a picture of you reading or something like that or somebody pull out their phone and get some video you know i'd be like narrating and then i get to a tense part and i start doing the tense part crap and then i notice that someone's filming me and then i'm just like now i'm performing <laughs> but it was so much fun 
the whole thing. I mean, that was what I was there for was to be able to do something like that. So I was glad that we were able to do that. And then later on, after our panels, we did a post show episode for the story that we read the day before, which was also really cool because, again, we had mics for everybody. We were all able to sit around. It was like recording a conversation that we had as if we just took the mics to the pizza place or something and everybody sat around. And we even had pizza for that matter because we had them deliver some to our room that night. No, but, but you, you didn't mention the dark side of L. Scribe Harris's reading, which was <laughs> we discovered the next day that, oh. <laughs> that our mics weren't on well, or weren't right. recording. Yeah, something was wrong with your mic. Yours, thank oh. Scribe, really, or thank Scott Sigler. Or well, I, I, I don't know who you would thank. Maybe the, the guy we're calling Jim. Okay, thank Jim that that was recording. That because, yours was recording because the vast majority was narration. Yeah. The vast majority oh. was narration, and it was a pretty long story. I don't think it was quite as long as yours was. I don't know how long yours was. Oh, really? It's, it felt like it was longer, but yeah. I think it was because I was the only one doing the talking as opposed to your story was had more lines and stuff, so it was more divided up. And It was also late at night. Yeah, there was that too. My eyes were, uh, yeah, they were blurring out. It's funny too, because the very next day we discovered that as speakers, we were entitled to a pair of special glasses that were supposed to reduce eye fatigue when using a computer. And they see through clothes. Yeah, that's a good part about them too. But yeah, I was given these glasses the next day after I finished reading that entire story. I just thought, boy, those would have been so useful. And I could have had them the night before because I was already entitled to them. All I had to do was go there and get them, but I didn't realize that until later. So. They have these yellow lenses. They remind me of the sunglasses that Bono would wear, <laughs> like in the 90s era of U2. Uh -huh. So there's something, to me, very European about them, very <laughs> hipster about them, especially when you're wearing them. It's so weird to see you wear glasses. Yeah, it's weird for me to wear them. I actually have been wearing them all week just to see if they really do reduce eye strain because I use a computer all day long, so I might as well. I still haven't been able to decide if they actually do or not. It's funny because we were talking about, you know, Brian's abilities, his latent mutant abilities. <laughs> <laughs> and I very nearly asked the lady, hey, do you want to give us a copy of, or something like that to read? And we will we'll promote these glasses. And if you want, you know, to give us a couple extra pairs, you know, we can give them away or something like that, you know? And I, in the end, I was just like, uh, what if, you know, kind of thing. And I didn't do it. But, but part of it was, I guess we would have to endorse them and say, hey, these really, really rock, you know, and it got me laid on karaoke night and stuff like that. And it didn't feel like I should be doing it. It didn't get you laid on karaoke night, so you couldn't? No, I, ultimately I didn't do it, but it seems like that's the sort of thing that we should do to get more revenue, to get more, okay. I, I don't know, that kind but, of thing. But what did Brian do? He got down on his knees and pleasured the woman. What do you mean? <laughs> he did? He did exactly what you were saying that you should have done. He asked this woman and she gave him a little piece of paper that showed him how he could do that and to earn money off of it. So there you go. Brian has latent mutant abilities okay, that well, Rish will never have. Well, Brian has listenership for this World of Warcraft podcast that's just astounding. The numbers of people that listen to this podcast and all of those guys are computer users. Nerds. Even more so than our listeners because, you know, they actually perch themselves in front of a computer monitor for hours every week, if not every day. And so if these sunglasses could prevent eye strain from these guys, yeah, I mean, that would be awesome. That would be great. That would be – these are, are the target audience, I would think. Right. But I would think people who write could be counted in that same kind of a target audience and maybe we could have got some folks to do that. But we don't know how because we didn't talk to them about it. You didn't even try. But that's okay. You know, that, we don't have those latent abilities. So we had our panels that next day. Tell us about them, Rish Outfield. What happened? What did you learn? How did you feel? Are you gay? Everybody's a little gay. <laughs> Everybody's a little bit lacist. That too. <laughs> Except for the dirty Appalachians. Sorry, I, I, I wanted just to name some race that it was okay to make fun of, but there's not really yeah, there's no many such thing. left. Renee's panel was about how to use tone and emotion 
to create a, uh, a compelling fiction podcast. And she really prepared. She had uh, slides. She had clips from Seinfeld. <laughs> she had several audio examples, most of which I recognized because it was stuff from our show, stuff from Journey Into, stuff from Drabblecast, you know, stuff that we had heard before. They just talked about different techniques, what you do to keep your voice going when you have to read and read and read. And, and yeah, that's something that Renee and Brian have over me and, and Abby as well, that they've been making money from audio narration, from doing audio books, from reading them. Now, Brian and Renee have been going out there and getting work, you know, saying, I am a talented voice artist. You have a book that needs to be read. If you pay me, I will do it. And, and, and it's so weird because when they were telling us this on the very first night that we were there, this little voice in my head was like, why are you not doing this? It's the pot you were born to play, baby, kind of thing. I, I was just, holy cow. I felt ambition for the first time in <laughs> a long time. And it, it was like, oh gosh, I got to go out there. I got to do this right now. So in that respect, I got something huge out of the New Media Expo, the same sort of thing that I maybe I would have gotten out of one of those panels kind of thing, although in a totally different way. But to be more proactive in seeking work, that was something that I, I guess I hadn't considered it. But I am doing that now, just in the couple of days we've been home. And so far, it has paid diddly. And, and I'll let people know if there's any fruit from this particular seed. Oh. But yes, like Renee was talking about techniques that you can do to keep your mouth going and your throat and your voice consistent. And they also talked about emotion. They talked about acting or conveying, emoting, that's the word I'm looking for, you know, with your voice. And Brian talked a little bit about editing, you know, doing the post-production kind of thing to make it sound more professional, more... Well, it did the sort of things that we do on a regular basis, but there were still a couple of things that I hadn't considered that I hadn't heard. Yeah, it was fun to listen to their panel. Sometimes I wished that I could be up there with them, but we, you know, they weren't allowed to have more people. Maybe next year they'll let us have more people. But yes, there were times when we would just ask questions or we would have a dialogue with them. And I wonder if you listen to the actual recording of the panels, if there's just silence during those moments. Yeah, I don't know how well the audience talking comes through. I've seen a few press conferences where reporters are asking questions, just like, and they, oh, yeah. And then they just answer, and you have no idea even what their question was. You're just like, man, it'd be nice if you restated the I hate that too, question yeah. or something. I don't know. There was a time where I knew that they didn't quite state something that they wanted to state. I'm like, yeah, what about this? <laughs> was my question just to get him to say the one thing that I wanted them to say. <laughs> That's me being a dork. They didn't annoy us in the same way in our panel. It was annoying? Well, I'm sure I was annoying. I don't know. Oh, see, I didn't realize it was annoying. <laughs> I don't know if it was annoying. Maybe they appreciated the help. The sad thing was, and I guess you've got to expect that, is that they are not known for their art stuff. So there weren't a lot of people that showed up for either of our panels. For the most part, it was our group of podcasters plus a couple others. There was like one person in the room in each panel that we didn't already know, which is kind of a shame. But if they keep this thing up, maybe that will change and the panels will grow. But yeah, so their panel was on tone and emotion and it was a lot of really good stuff to learn if you wanted to do narration you know, starter course. I think theirs was on the beginner level and ours was on the intermediate level or something like that. I don't know. Is that true? <laughs> I think so. I think that's why we were in different rooms or something like that, which seems weird, but I'm not I sure. I think Libsyn guy was in the same room as us though, right? True. Wow. Libsyn guy stood at the same <laughs> podium. <laughs> Later was ours after lunch. I think we had lunch, then we went back and it was ours and ours was like the last panel of all. Which Brian said it was like the death slot. You know, <laughs> nobody goes to the last panel. They left. They went to Sunday, Monday, and then they were gone before Tuesday. I, which is, I mean, shoot, when you go to Comic-Con, how much stuff do you go to on Sunday? Yeah, good point. Very Nothing. little. They usually don't have much on Sunday. Yeah. yeah. At least in this case, they had a full day of things as much as they had on any other day. But 
I guess by the end, everybody's on their way. Um, they had Scott Sigler there true. talking about the creative side of what we do. I think his got attended much better than ours. Yeah. And is it because it was advertised as a keynote or is it actually because people knew who Scott Sigler was? That's probably a little of both I'd be willing to bet. Okay. Scott Sigler is a pretty big name in podcasting. He's been doing it for such a long time and he's made a career out of it. I mean, he published books and I think they may have even made the bestseller list. At the very least, they were on the Amazon top list or something like that. But yeah. Rob said he had been podcasting for nine years or something like that. And I was just like, there were podcasts yeah. in 2003? Well, and he works for a podcast hosting company. so He does. That's right. So it's you would kind of expect him to have been. The right? podcast hosting Pretty company. much. Yeah, the biggest one. You okay. kind of expect him to be on the avant-garde of that whole Atish. thing. He spoke French. Okay, and, and our panel was, or Abby's panel, if you will, was on comedy. Specifically using comedy to humanize characters and hook listeners. Right. I think is what it was. And we had rehearsed our panel the day before. Kind of, oh, and then I'll say this and then what will you guys say? And that I'm sure was very unfortunate for Marshall, <laughs> Renee, and Brian. But... For us, it was probably very fortunate because we kind of – it's not that we had a script, but we kind of knew, okay, and then I say my part and then Scribe's going to say this. And it probably went much better because we had rehearsed it. Yeah, I, I was so. a little worried before we went of, you know, will I know what to say or when to say or will I have said too much kind of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, I was I, definitely the same way. I was afraid we were unprepared. and But since we did that beforehand, we were ready to go for that one guy that showed up. <laughs> Yeah, and the, and there were a couple of people that we didn't know that showed and a couple of people that stood up and left partway through. And Abby kind of made a joke about that where she's like, well, you're always going to offend somebody like you, ma'am. You know, she was walking out or whatever. It was a very Rich Outfieldian thing to say. Yeah. Uh, like, like Dickensian, you know, Outfieldian. <laughs> but there was this guy, this, this, this middle-aged guy, salt and pepper hair guy and – I said to Lauren before the panel, you know, that's the guy. Well, none of us know that guy, but that's the guy that we have to make laugh. You know, all these other people will laugh because they know us or because they're friendly. And, but that guy looks stern and serious and sober, and we must make him laugh. Turns out he was drunk as a skunk. That's why he was still there the whole time, because he couldn't balance himself enough to get up and walk out. And, and yeah, when Abby introduced Lauren as L. Scribe Harris, he burst out in laughter. <laughs> and so, yeah, there we go. We made it. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I felt uh, affection for that guy. I mean, I, I actually started talking to that guy as part of the panel. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Because I, I hadn't done a lot of these things before. I've done public speaking. I, I don't mind that. I, I'm, you know, I'm an actor. So that kind of thing doesn't frighten or upset me. And if there had been 150 people in the room, I would have been fine. But you know, if it had been 150 people frowning and not amused or looking at their GD cell phones or iPads or whatever people have now, their e-shunt machines, <laughs> I, uh, that would have been harder. But this guy... He did laugh a little bit, and it might have been polite laughter, but who cares? You know, I'll take what I can get. That was neat to have this target, this, this. He was a symbol, you know, the That's outsider right. kind of thing. And you won him over, and all the symbolic outsiders that came with him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And one thing that I sort of mentioned is that they recorded these panels. And so they might be out there somewhere being listened to right now by people that wanted to go to the New Media Expo but couldn't, by people who went to the New Media Expo page for a panel that they did want to see and then looked at the list and was like, oh, hey, a comedy one. So it's possible that there are many more blue-shirted middle-aged gentlemen out there than just the one. That's true. Yeah. We can direct everyone to those podcasts or put them up on the feed or whatever. I think we're allowed to. Well, that's that's cool. Then people will know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you'll be able to hear the whole panel yourself. I felt like it went really well. I can't remember there being thunderous applause or, or laughter, but there was a 
not a punchline. There was a, a point. There was a band practicing next door to us that made it sound almost like thundering applause fairly often. Uh, when it was over, despite the empty room, this guy that we're calling Jim asked us, well, you, you, you tell him. Yeah, we're in his will, but also he asked us to come back for next year's show. And he already had plans for how he was going to expand it and make it even better. One of the things that I suggested is why don't we take what we all did in our room the night before. With the lights out. And put it on YouTube for everyone to see. Oh, no, uh, why don't we take that live reading that we did and do it on stage in front of everyone. And then people can see how a podcast like ours is made. They can see us mess it up, etc. When we're done, we can have, you know, like half of it being us doing the recording. The other half can be answering questions, etc. So I think you may see some stuff like that. And I'm sure he will try and invite more people like us that create fiction podcasts. So you'll even have more folks. So if you are interested in podcast fiction, if you're a fan, if you're into that scene then you might want to consider attending next year because we'll be there. Renee, Abby, the whole group, probably all be back. At least mostly I would be willing to bet. Probably even be more. And there'll be much more, I think, available for you to experience. At the very least, we'll try and get you some sunglasses. Are, are they sunglasses? I don't know that they count as sunglasses. They're not really for sun. I don't know that they even help at all in the sun. Screen glasses. What are, what are they called? I think they're just called glasses. Oh, well, that's not creative. That's that's the other part of the New Media Expo. <laughs> well, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was my secondary goal was to feel a breast. No. Unfortunately, it was mine. We're all tens in the dark, baby. <laughs> my secondary goal for the, the visit was I wanted to go to a karaoke bar. Oh. I did. I, I love that stuff. And... A scribe was super into it. She loves that stuff too. You know, she was talking about how great the karaoke bars are in North Carolina and Korea and Korea, Japan and, or whatever. Heaven, apparently. <laughs> she told stories that would curl your hair or straighten your hair, whatever is applicable to you, sir, on the third row in the blue shirt. <laughs> That's right. And it, and so. <laughs> hey, he oh, laughed. You. Oh, I it's just choking. Oh, darn. Somebody called 911. You and I went to the Mirage Casino looking for karaoke the very first night. Yeah, you and I had gone there in years past or something like that. I thought maybe it would be there. I thought I had. <laughs> I asked my sister, hey, which casino did we stay at You know, for New Year's two years ago? Was it the Sahara? And she said, no, it was the Mirage. I was like, oh, okay, a Mirage, cool. We'll figure out where that is. And Abby has this thing on her phone that tells you where things are. It's like if, if there was a Dora the Explorer character, it would have a voice and a name. And it, she has this thing on her phone. And it told Can us. Can you imagine if you got that app on your phone? <laughs> I'm the app. 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 <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> And so we walked over to the Mirage. Yeah, yes, and it wasn't there because it was uh, you know, an optical illusion caused by <laughs> ref light refraction and heat. On uh, um, we we looked around. We couldn't find the karaoke room, and none of it looked familiar to me. And finally, uh, there was a supermodel working <laughs> as a greeter at some. It was an opium den, and. <laughs> <laughs> we asked her about karaoke, and she told us where that could be had, and uh, you got her number. Unfortunately, we didn't hear anything that she said because other things were on our mind. I uh, know she gave us two options, sadly. She said, oh, there's karaoke at this place right across the street. It says here on the internet, and you can always believe what the internet says. Or there's this place. It's Oh, it's just like old Vegas. Really? What place is this? It's uh, called Ellis Island. Oh, it's it's really it, it's it's one of those places. It's like old Vegas. It's mm -hmm. got you know that, that kind of old Vegas style to it. Well, they've got you know like two ninety nine midnight buffets, and you know it's like old Vegas. Man, your breasts are pretty. Uh, <laughs> but do you know of any place where they have karaoke around? 
<laughs> it was kind of, I had to ask her to write the things down. She wrote them down on the piece of paper for me, which was good. But unfortunately, the internet lied. We should have listened to this girl, honestly, because she mentioned the old Vegas thing again and again. She seemed to really want us to go to Ellis Island, and we should have listened. Well, the real problem was she said the other one was right across the street from where we were. And so I thought, oh, perfect. Close. We'll go to that. And so yeah. we set up to go to that. We even announced on Facebook, hey, everybody, meet us at this place at this time. And then we went. We couldn't even find it. How could it be right across the street and completely invisible? They, was, maybe they should have called it the Mirage. Yeah, there you go. We wow. went. It was supposed to be at the Imperial Palace. We walked up and down the street and all those guys snapping their cards at us as we walked. No wonder we couldn't concentrate on where we were going. It was like snappity snap. But like It was like a war movie there. It was like shots from all sides and we were running. We could never find this place. We finally asked somebody and they're like, oh, I can't give you directions unless you buy something. So we bought something and then asked for directions. <laughs> and they said, I don't know. <laughs> You're like, you bastard. <laughs> And we found out finally that it's, it's the one place that's got construction and it's behind the construction. And even then we still wandered back and forth in front of it, trying to find the way behind the construction to get to it. But we finally get in there and there's no karaoke there. Not at all. There's no casino. It's just a mirage. <laughs> we get there and yeah, there's nothing. So we piled into Rish's car and we re it really was piling in at this point. There was barely enough seats for all of us. We were dead tired at this point, too, because we've been walking back and forth and up and down the strip and everywhere. And I was just like, we're going to go look for this other place, but I don't know if I even have the energy to deal with it anymore. Luckily, I was able to get a second wind, although I was pretty wiped out the whole rest of the night. We drove around in circles for a while, back and forth, after getting directions as to how to go to this Ellis Island place. And then we finally saw it and got there. And a guy told us that he lost his virginity in the... Uh, was it the same kind of car that you drove? Is that what he was saying? Yeah, let's 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 set the stage. This guy approached me and he said, "Great car, man. I lost my virginity in that car." <laughs> and what is the response to that statement? <laughs> So what did uh, he said something like, uh, "Congratulations. Uh, we'll wipe down the seats then." But the funny thing is how nice this guy was because usually it's like a panhandler or a crazy guy or you know whatever it is you don't want him to come around but what a nice overly loud drunken stranger <laughs> yeah like the person that we parked on the street to the next day where i had my window down and we pull up to the light and there's the panhandler on the corner and he sees my window down and immediately starts walking towards me and i was just like what? need to get that up quick <laughs> That sucks because he's a human being, but yeah. uh, well, we could do a whole episode. Let's talk. Uh, let's do an episode about panhandlers someday. Okay. So we went in this place. It was small. It was just the bar section of a casino, casino that had a restaurant attached to it, and it was packed. At first, it, was, it seemed like it might be standing room only. But then, luckily, a few people exited right, one table, and then a few more people after that. And so we were all able to sit and, and spread out, too, which was nice. A couple of Brian's buddies ended up showing up after a little while. or people They might not even have been buddies, but <laughs> people, contacts he made at the New Media Expo. I mean, he's a handsome man, so maybe they wanted to get into his pants. I, I, well, that's I, possible. It was interesting that it was Vegas. It's it smelled like Manuel Noriega's chamber pot in there. <laughs> it was two in the morning, and yet the guy had a real problem with like profanity and drinking on the stage and and things like. That. There were so many more rules for Las Vegas karaoke than there were for you know Little Rock karaoke at nine p.m. kind of thing, which I thought was interesting. Also. I've, I've been to a lot of karaoke places. This guy was so much less happy to be there than any other karaoke DJ I've seen. I, I mean it. The guy just 
maybe he was tired. Maybe he felt ill. Oh, I, I it was like his last day of the week. I know he was when when it finished. He's like, yeah, I'm out of here for three days, and f all you. Woo. Yeah, I know that was one of the rules, but f all you anyway. <laughs> Abby had gotten sick, so she wasn't able to come with us, and Marshall had to go to Toronto of all places, the state of Toronto. Toronto and gosh. and so it was the, the Abby and and Marshall missed out on. Oh my lord! Did you smell your? Be closed the next day. Yeah, the unfortunate thing for me is I happen to be wearing a sweater that's dry clean only that day. <laughs> so oh. it's just sitting in there and I'm like, great, I'm going to have to dry clean this dang thing. But yeah, it's it's awful. It smells like it, it basically an ashtray. It's like the ashtray that's just been there and there's years worth of ashes in this thing. That's what my sweater smells like. I guess in Nevada, you're allowed to smoke. You can smoke wherever, wherever you want. The frick you yeah. want. You can go into someone else's house and be like, hey, I need to smoke for a minute. So just back off. <laughs> can use their drinking glasses as ashtrays. And yeah, 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 but only if they're full of something that they want to still drink. If it's empty, you can't. If I'm remembering correctly, this is the first time you and I have gone to a karaoke place together. Yeah, there was one time we went... There was like the town fair here in, in oh, town. Oh, when we they went. chose the lottery and, and the, the two children that would right. die. Right, yeah. And we sang at the special uh, pre-lottery karaoke thing. We only got in one song because it was so abominably cold for some reason that day. We went and it was outside. It was on the stage outdoors. And we like set up for one song and the wind was just blowing furiously. And it was friggin' freezing. And we were just we there. We didn't with... know what cold was. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> But yeah, it was so uncomfortable that we sang like one song each and then we're just like, all right, let's get out of here. Have this. And you had your chillins too. Yeah. And chillin is the right word because that's what they were doing. <laughs> but I had wanted to go to karaoke with you for, for years and years and it just never worked out. And so yeah. we went there and uh, yeah, that's something apparently that Scribe does all the time. And uh, Brian wouldn't be caught dead doing. I got the impression <laughs> <laughs> that I could have been at like a... Uh, accounting slash Big Bang Theory aficionado convention and been less miserable than poor Brian. But there was alcohol, so he was able to at least have some of that. I hope that was a balm. Oh, poor man. Yeah, we couldn't find any death metal songs for him to do karaoke for. Unfortunately, uh, Dragula by Rob Zombie wasn't close enough. I've actually Watch. done Dragula at... Yeah, you dressed up like Rob Zombie oh. and did it, didn't you? Yeah, sorry. I think All I've right. seen the pictures. The naughty pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I, Having not gone with you, what did you think? Was it a fun experience for you? It was fun. I would have had, I think, twice as much fun had we gone there first. Instead of oh, looking, looking for the Imperial over the Palace place. and walking back and forth and back and forth until my leg was just aching. And I just wanted to sit down, and I was super tired. That place did karaoke until 3 a.m., mm -hmm. and we were there almost until then before we finally uh, finished up. And yeah, I was pretty beat by the time we were done. Had we gone there first and started at the regular time and not worn myself out beforehand, I think I would have had a lot more fun. Also, I, I find that I don't know what to sing when it's karaoke singing time. I signed up to sing Rio by Duran Duran because it's a song that I like. Oh, see, I thought it was because they were staying at the Rio. I honestly <laughs> did. I thought, wow, yeah, this that's is... what I actually sang. We're at the Rio in room 1116. Uh, and, and what did you rhyme with six? By... <laughs> uh, it's a song that I like, but I don't, it's not one that I listened to a lot back in the 80s. When it was around, it didn't play on the radio nearly as much as other songs that perhaps I could sing it. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I like that song. Uh, I'll do that one. That one's... And then afterwards, I'm like, shoot, I can't think of how the verses even go on that song. And I'm sure there's some kind of a bridge in there that is even different. Will I remember that? And yeah, there's a point in the middle when it gets to the bridge and I realize I'm singing it like a verse. And then I re oh, this isn't right. This is the part where it goes alive, alive, alive. So I kind of changed it up in the middle, but that's my problem. I'm not sure what song I know well enough to sing. So I just flail and I pick one and then I get up there and I realize halfway through, oh shoot, this isn't one I know well enough. I should have picked a different song. 
Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I've struggled with that before, too. There was one time we went where everybody that was at the con convention, everybody that was at the karaoke bar that night, they were all cowboys. And I didn't right. realize it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, every song has been a country song. And it's a certain kind of it's a country and Western song kind of thing. <laughs> so I tried to please them by it was like, OK, OK. Oh, Willie Nelson. All right. I know that, you know, kind of thing. And it's like they sensed I was not one of them. Yeah. And he says, you said doing you ain't one of us kind of thing. And it's just, oh, but on the contrary for me that night. I would say there were two songs the whole evening that I didn't know that people sang. I, I mean, it was song after song after song after song that I knew. Right. Which was yeah, great. I had, I had just as much fun sitting at the table singing back and forth with each other as I did when I actually had to get up on stage and perform for everybody. And there was an interesting thing was just some of the freaking people. Like one of the songs that I didn't really know very well was uh, performed by this woman that just had the freaking most amazing voice. And there was another woman who performed right before her. The two people in a row. One woman gets up and she did Proud Mary. The blonde. Right. Way better than majority of the people you see on your American Idols or your x Factors and all those kind of shows. But you wouldn't say she did it better than Tina Turner doing <laughs> Proud Mary with Rod Stewart. Oh, I would never say that. Okay. No, this woman was awesome. And she was gorgeous, too, which only made things worse because... It's just not fair. And then right after her, another woman gets up and just had this amazing voice and did another just amazing, which I didn't know the song, but it was amazing. Maybe you didn't know it either. I don't know. It was a song about, you know, why are we kidding each other? Why haven't we broken up yet? Song, which, gosh. It, yeah, it sounded like a, an early 70s R&B yeah. ballad that I, I didn't know, but was, boy, she sold she, it. Yeah, she, awesome. Song that I'd never heard before, and I still was just like, wow. And then she actually stuck around long enough to do another song later, and her voice was just, she probably could have done it in that loud bar without the mic. She had that big of a voice. Like when she would hit the big notes, it was blowing the mic out. And I think she was still even holding it like way down away from her. And it was still just more than the mic could handle. There were some really good singers and there were some average singers and there was a few people that sucked. But usually at these things, there are a lot more people that suck than right. don't there because that many. they've got the liquid courage in them <laughs> that makes them think that they can sing when they can't. Also, if you've drank too much... You don't know what you're saying and you're my kind of thing. But I thought the vast majority were really, really good. Yeah. And we had to wait like 90 minutes before our first song. Yeah, it took a while. And so it was just like, wow, how are we going to, how are we going to measure up to these great people, these professional level people? Yeah, it was, but I don't know. I think everybody did all right. Except yeah. Brian. Yeah, Brian didn't Brian do sucked. at all. Oh, no. <laughs> I remember it differently. <laughs> He did the, the theme to A Summer Place. It, it, was, it was great, but there are no lyrics to that song. <laughs> so It was a good time. I felt kind of bad because we had announced on Facebook, Hey, everybody, meet us at the Dune Steve here at Imperial Palace at this time. And we didn't even get to the Imperial Palace until at least an hour after we said, Everybody, meet us. And then there was no karaoke there anyway, so where would they have met us at? Luckily, later I saw on Facebook there were several people that live in Vegas who were like, oh, gosh, I would have loved to have gone, but I just couldn't. Nobody said, oh, you mother -ers, where the f*** were you? I was there. I walked around the whole f***ing Imperial Palace. There isn't even a karaoke room there. So I count that as much of a success as the blue shirt guy sticking around for our panel. All right. That we didn't piss anybody off. I'm kind of sad. we didn't. Get, I know that Wendy Cooper lives in Vegas, and we didn't get a chance to meet her. And there were several other people that live in Vegas that we also did not get a chance to meet. But maybe next year, since they invited us back. And this time around, we know Ellis Island. Hopefully they still exist and still do karaoke at that point. And maybe we'll get a chance to see some of that old Vegas yeah. flavor at Ellis Island. It turns out uh, that it was the Sahara the, the, that where, where they had the karaoke room, karaoke hall or whatever. I, I would like to try that out. If we could go back, but well, we could just do a karaoke night every night. You know, I'd do that. But <laughs> when there's a bunch of strangers and you have to wait your turn and sometimes it's a drudgery or, you know, it, it's enervating if that's a word. 
to stand up there and sing, but if you have to wait an hour and 10 minutes or whatever in between your turn and, and the next turn, sometimes you lose all that energy. Right. But I really enjoy the singing, and it would be fun. And I, I think Scribe was trying to find a duet that we could do together, and, and I thought of two or three afterward that, oh, <laughs> that would have been perfect. I'll bet she knows that. But at the time, yeah, it's just your mind sort of empties out. It's like, what songs yeah. do I know? They also only had one mic, so I don't know how that would have worked. There was a time when Scribe wanted me to put in – a song for all of us to go up and do together. And I just thought, how will that work? They only have one mic. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. I, usually you'd take the DJ's mic. and I mean, the DJ will always have a live mic so that he can help out the person. On, I, I, I'm sorry, this, this should be the rule <laughs> that when somebody is stumbling or somebody's not confident or whatever, you know, they're, they're nervous, that you sing with them, you help them out because you're the DJ. That, that's part of your job. The other part of your job is to make the person feel like they did well. And he did neither of these things. <laughs> but uh, he did thank the three people that tipped him but loudly and rudely yeah. every time someone and complained about all those others that didn't. Yeah, he's just not the guy that you want officiating at your funeral. <clears throat> or maybe he is, but not doing your karaoke night. That's right. Oh, I had the wires crossed. You seem to be very tired right now. Have we been talking too long? I know 102 episodes doesn't come around very often. That's but. true. No, I'm just getting uncomfortable in this damned kitchen chair. But we're pretty much done, too. I mean, I don't know what else we have to say. The last day we all went home. <gasps> we did. Yeah, we had to say goodbye to everyone. Pretty much karaoke night was our last fling with most everybody, and we didn't see him again. After that. Yeah, I didn't get to say goodbye to Abby. We, I guess we should have thought, you know, she feels ill. We won't be seeing her again. But it didn't occur to me. There was this moment when you and me and Brian and Lauren were all in the Rio together and we were about to go our separate ways. And it felt like and I, I never got to go to camp, but it felt like at the end of a movie about camp where it's time for camp to end and everybody's going to go back home. Okay, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But it just, it was sad that it had to end. And to me, that's that's awesome. That's what I imagined camp was like. You made these friends, these people that you didn't know, and now you're, they're your friends. But in fact, your experience at camp was much different. <laughs> yeah, there was a little less pillow biting at this uh, particular event. But Pillow biting. <laughs> I'm sorry, how awful is that? Should I not have said that? No, it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of like that. I mean, I tried to say, I, I, on the other hand, did realize that we wouldn't be seeing Abby again. So as we walked out the door to go to karaoke, I tried to give her a goodbye, which I'm sure she doesn't remember at all because she did say in an email afterwards that she only vaguely remembers anything that happened there. She does distinctly remember the giant bunny that came in and performed that dance routine and then jumped off the balcony to his death. Um, but yeah, none of the other stuff that we did that day does she remember at all. And enough about Scott Sigler. <laughs> Sorry, I, don't. I did try and say goodbye to her, and yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was like that. Oh yeah, it was nice to meet you, and it's good to have fun. See you next year. <laughs> have a great summer. Um, all that stuff, and yeah, heading our separate ways. It's always better to end things early and leave them wanting more than to do an hour and a half podcast <laughs> that burns people out completely. Yeah. But the cool thing is, yeah, we already got the invitation for next year, so we can start plugging it, you know, everybody. If you ever wanted to meet Dune Steve or Abby or Brian or et cetera, I don't, I don't know that I can speak for everybody necessarily being there, but we, the two of us, are definitely planning on being back next year. It's close enough to us that we can drive without it being too much of a terrible ordeal. And Rish has relatives in the area, free lodging, etc. It couldn't be much more ideal for us to attend this thing. So we'll definitely be back next year. And as we said, Jim wants to make it even a bigger thing next year. So there'll be even more stuff to check out and attend. I'm sure that there'll be other podcasters that weren't there this year that will be there next year. So it'll be even more of a thing. And so especially for those folks that live in Vegas that we didn't get to see because we blew it with the whole karaoke night thing. And we'd definitely like to be able to run into you guys next year. And those of you that perhaps are in the area near enough to Vegas that you could get there without it being too much of a slog. 
you know, we'd like to uh, be able to run into you as well. So we can say, Ellis Island, this time, this day. <laughs> see, see, I'm wanting to do Sahara, but... Well, we can do Sahara too, but Ellis Island, we know. Sahara, we're still like, well, they had it two years ago, now three. Now three. Okay. Uh, do they have it still? And do they do it every night of the week or just certain nights? We know, Ellis Island, every day. It's kind of like Old Vegas. Yeah, it's a little Old vegas -y. I remember how Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra would do karaoke. Okay, well, hey, if you've listened all the way through this episode, then you're a real fan of yes. the show. Um, but you wouldn't have been listening in the first place unless you were a real fan. Thank you for being with us for 102 episodes, which uh, by my math is nine conversations that we've had <laughs> on the show. That's between right. Between us. We need to split this one up into 15 different episodes. This should do us until June. Come on. Again, thanks. Yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, have a good week or so. Yeah, your mountain, Spock, is waiting. So be on your way. Did I get that wrong? I don't know. You don't know? I've never heard that quote before in my life. Thank you, Mr. Roseman. <laughs> good night. That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. This show is lame. As lame as Rish Outfield. I, I know we've been talking for a long time, but it's the 102nd episode yeah. spectacular. Yeah, it's a special episode, so we can keep going. <laughs> Excuse me. Let me sneeze one more time, but louder. Anyways, uh, we got to Vegas on Sunday afternoon. Uh. Ah! And uh, shortly after... And we'd like to thank Branford Marsalis for being here for our big special episode. <laughs> Who's somebody that plays a trombone? Is there anybody that we would know the name of? Commander William oh. Riker. <laughs> Josh Roseman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, he brought us uh, Robot and Frank. I saw the trailer for that. Mm -hmm. It looked awesome. I'm yeah. not joking in any way. It, you know, he, he bugged me about, hey, have you heard of Robot and Frank? It's a movie. It, you know, it's playing 61 miles away from where you live. You, know, you could drive to see it. <laughs> And, that, and I had no interest because of the kinds of movies that Samuel Goldwyn makes. And then I saw the trailer and I was like, it looks really, really cool. Cool. We'll have to watch it sometime. When we start When we start our movie review podcast, that can be the first one we trash. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a movie you're, you're allowed to trash. It's an art film. Oh, right. It would be like trashing Southland tales. <laughs> no one would do that. The room. <clears throat> um, <laughs> before we get to the panel, do we want to talk about the reading at all? Because that was the day before, and the panel was after. Do we want to keep it chronological, and will you please stop farting? Or I do you push the microphone away? Why? Why would I? Do we want to try and keep it chronological, or do we care? <laughs> please stop farting. <laughs> Hello, kettle. I'm the pot. You're looking black today.